Welcome back to the Family Law Channel. I'm Scott Drake. The new Mrs. Mark Zuckerberg might not have to worry much about money, but uh, that doesn't mean she's automatically a billionaire after the wedding. Uh, my guest is retired Superior Court Judge from Santa Clara, California, the host of the Family Law Channel. Please welcome Judge Eugene Hyman. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk about how California looks at this. Um, California uh, is one of probably, I guess, a dozen states that follow community property laws, which, which I guess in this particular case, everything that Mark had generated prior to the marriage is his, and now what becomes hers is that part that's generated after they get married. Is that safe to say? Well, actually, all states are community property states. It's just yeah. a question of um, what they, how they treat certain kinds of uh, assets in terms of how they have to be divided and also um, how they treat, and this is usually by case law decision, mm -hmm. how they treat separate property that has been perhaps transformed into community property or does it keep its characterization of a separate property. I think our discussion really has to begin with what is a prenuptial. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there isn't any evidence that to say that they have one or they aren't saying. Correct. But, uh, so what is a prenuptial, Judge? Uh, a prenuptial is basically an agreement between a party getting married. And in California, <clears throat> it could even be a same-sex couple during that period of time when same-sex couples could get married in California, uh, an agreement between parties that say that what you um, what you had acquired uh, before marriage and then what you even possibly acquire after marriage as a result of what you had before marriage um, will remain yours. In other words, let's say hypothetically uh, someone owns a house before they uh, got married, and that they have a prenuptial agreement. A typical prenuptial agreement will say, okay, um, that house that was acquired before marriage will remain the separate property of the mm -hmm. person that owned it prior to marriage, even if community property is being used to pay the mortgage, which would mm -hmm. normally give the community an interest in the house proportionate to the amount uh, of the mortgage to the amount that it paid it down. Or let's say hypothetically you have this, uh, this house and um, wages after marriage, which are usually community property, mm -hmm. were used to improve it. And if you have a prenuptial that says it, then even though you're using community property wages, the house will maintain its separate property status. So these agreements uh, can be pretty much uh, anything that the parties agree to, mm -hmm. as long as, and these are the considerations, as long as there's an arm length uh, transaction that is, is something that wasn't uh, coercively uh, forced on someone, uh, usually what you look to in those kinds of a situations is mm -hmm. one was the agreement signed in relationship to the marriage. Uh, the recommendation of uh, case law and most lawyers would be that you want to hopefully separate the date of the signing of the prenuptial from the date mm -hmm. of the marriage by a long period of time, because the longer the period of time that's involved, then this helps support the holder, the owner of the prenuptial, uh, in terms of uh, being able to say that the mm -hmm. other person wasn't coerced, because the the prenuptials that are signed just before the marriage mm -hmm. allow the the person who's later contesting the prenuptial to say, "What was I supposed to do? My family right. was there, mm -hmm. my friends were there, we paid for everything, and you know, if I refused, it would be a disaster." So you want as much space as possible between the date of the mm -hmm. signing and the date of the marriage. Secondly, you want to make sure that both sides are represented by counsel, that you don't have a situation which frequently occurs where the the person who writes the prenuptial is also giving advice to the person who's signing the prenuptial who will be giving up substantial rights, mm -hmm. uh, because then that suggests that the person wasn't making a knowing and intelligent decision mm -hmm. regarding whether to sign the prenuptial. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that there has to be a full disclosure by the person wanting the prenuptial in terms of uh, what they own. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes a major problem develops where a person 
doesn't fully disclose uh, their net worth. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with that is that how can a person make an informed decision if they don't know what the the total assets are that that we're talking about? Right. How about, uh, can, can, can you talk about, I mean, I guess to clarify what I was saying, I mean, as you said, all states have community property laws. California's and a few other states are a little different because it specifically outlines how property is divided, where in other states, I think, as you indicated, there are sort of equitable, equitable exactly. division rules where the court kind of says, well, what's fair here? What should right. happen? And this is right. fairly specific. What, would you say also that when you're talking about this kind of a situation, if she has legal advisors, it's in her best interest to have a prenup, right? Probably? Well... To protect her in some way, you know, as far as property, because, you know, I mean, uh, as, you, as you indicate, the growth of property after the marriage, you know, what is she specifically entitled to? The growth of the stock, if she has, you know, any after, after you know, uh, after they're married, that kind of thing. Well, you, you're. I, mean, I, I think that having an agreement can be uh, advantageous. And if I were rep representing um, Mr. Zucker Zuckerman, what I would recommend to him is that the prenuptial would have sort of a sliding scale to it, is that the mm -hmm. longer that they're married, the more assets that she would get. Right. Because that, that speaks to equality, and it speaks to a lack of overreaching on his part. Mm -hmm. Because that's what courts are looking at, to see whether or not you're overreaching and taking a huge disadvantage. I mean, the situation of the multi-multi-billionaire marrying someone who has ver virtually little, uh, the courts are going to say, you know, you're being greedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, share, share the love, share the wealth. Whereas if, if you do have sort of a sliding scale where the person gets more and more based upon the length of the marriage, then that suggests that you are, in fact, in love with this person and that you want it to be fair. Because if you're in love, you want to be fair. I, I certainly uh, understand what you're saying there, Judge. <laughs> well, I mean, not everyone. I, I would not want uh, the listeners to get the idea that everyone needs a prenuptial, because mm -hmm. I, I think that in in certain cases, a prenuptial can set uh, the wrong message, that right. there's a message of distrust that, you know, granted, 50% of marriages, certainly in California and in divorce, um, and in the, in the United States, it's probably close to 50 percent, um, but there is some negativity associated sure. with the prenuptial, and I, I think that only people with substantial wealth should even consider it. I mean, if you're fairly equal or close to equal, uh, right. then I think that it can be an affront to even suggest it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's, that's a good point, but certainly in, in this particular case, because there is so much uh, at stake, it's probably in his best interest, obviously, to have well, something planned you know, that, out. That, that's an interesting uh, theory, and what I mean by that is, is that he has so much that if he didn't have one, and he winds up splitting the pot, and she winds uh, assuming the unlike uh, the the sad event if they were to get divorced, mm -hmm. how many billion does he need? Right. Well, what would what a what a uh, I'm just trying to I'm trying to envision what a typical prenup would be in this situation. Could a prenup be something like, here's what's going to happen. Uh, in the event that our marriage dissolves after five years and we're working on a sliding right. scale, we're going to give you $100 million. Is that going to be okay? Right. And that's exactly. probably, would, would that be, would, would that be a, a, a reasonable solution, do you yes. think? Okay. Well, but the other thing is, is to acknowledge up front right. what he has going in. So at least you're not fighting over what he had the day prior to the marriage. Mm-hmm. So you've got the accounting and everything else, and by signing the agreement, she acknowledges basically what his worth was the day mm -hmm. before they got married. So that, at least that's one less thing to fight over. It sounds very complex. I wish I had his problems. Exactly. Um, you know, and hopefully, uh, you know, it works out. I mean, um, Bill Gates is still married, and he's been married mm -hmm. for quite some time. Right. Uh, Warren Buffett outlived uh, one wife and is has remarried and seems happy. Um, you know, it does happen. Unfortunately, um, we talk about uh, the reason why we bring the topic up is because of all the people that get divorced that are unhappy. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise once again. Thank you. And you're watching the Family Law Channel here on the Legal Broadcast Network.